Happy UNESCO World Philosophy Day 2014. This is a day where we get to talk about the discipline of philosophy in a more broad, popular, public way. And so I wanted to mark the occasion by doing a video specifically on public philosophy or popular philosophy, practical philosophy. Some people think these are, are you know, rigidly distinguished from each other. I think they kind of blend into each other. So this is in some respects a, a how-to video, giving you some ideas about uh, if you wanted to get into that sort of thing, how you might get involved in it. It's also a bit of a reflection and reminiscence video on, on my own experience in, in doing this. Um, in case you don't know me, I'm Greg Sadler. I have a YouTube channel devoted specifically to philosophy that's been around for about four years. I just rolled out a critical thinking channel, and this spring I'll be rolling out some new channels as well. One on ethics, one on the history of philosophy, probably one on continental philosophy. So, again, happy World Philosophy Day. Now we're going to talk about doing philosophy in a public, popular practical manner. One question that might occur to you to ask is, well, why would you want to do philosophy in a public way or in a popular way? You know, why make it practical? Aren't you watering it down? Aren't you sort of, you know, taking it out of the realm of, of philosophy, which is supposed to be abstract and you know, this high level of rationality and putting it down there, really throwing your pearls among swine. And my answer to that, uh, that I'll talk about a little bit more later, is this is something that philosophy has been doing for a very, very long time. As a matter of fact, it's at the very core of philosophy as it's traditionally conceived of and practiced. It's what makes philosophy exciting in, in many respects. There, There is a lot of stuff where you know we could be kind of elitist about it or insist that like Plato those who have not studied geometry or mathematics or set theory or pick whatever you want may not enter here before they walk into the academy but there's a lot of things where philosophy does impact the the broader world that we live in the life world as as people have, have called it what I want to talk about are four things right off the bat. Demand, need, capacity, and opportunity. And what do I mean by these? Well, there is a demand out there for doing philosophy in a more accessible way, in a way that ordinary people who are not necessarily going to college or who are not studying philosophy in an academic manner can make use of. Uh, these range from lifelong learners who want to know something about the history of ideas uh, to professionals who have to deal with critical thinking or ethics on a daily basis um, to students in other fields who may not even have an inkling that this stuff would, would turn them on. So there's this incredible hunger out there that I, I didn't realize at first exists for substantive engagement with ideas. That's what demand is. And so there is a real demand to be given philosophy, as well as, you know, real history, real literature, real religious studies, and not to have it, you know, just spoon-fed or oversimplified, but to have it provided to people in an accessible way. So that's that's an important element. Then I think there's also a need. And when I talk about need and contrast it to demand, what I mean there is with demand, people know that they want something. With need, quite often, people don't realize that philosophy, at least as practiced by, by some philosophers, is exactly what the doctor ordered. So, you know, business people... Um, they struggle to, to conceptualize how they want to approach their, their workplaces and how to raise the standards for ethics. And they try a lot of experiments, you know, to their credit. Um, I think most business people actually are, are quite interested in having an ethical marketplace and having an ethical workplace and having ethical practices in place. But it, it, takes some, it takes some thinking, and it really helps to have some background in the discipline. Same thing with critical thinking. 
you know, um, that's a buzzword among educators, but if you actually go to educators and you say, what exactly is critical thinking? Most of them on the spot can't give you any sort of uh, satisfactory, I don't say definition, but even characterization or enumeration. Some of them will even point you to Bloom's um, a hierarchy, which is not critical thinking. That's, that's a whole different thing because there's been a meme circulating around. So this is one of those, those, those areas where philosophers can really come in and contribute. You know, ethics, critical thinking, uh, a good grasp of the history of ideas. You know, a lot of the big ideas that have formed the world that we live in came to us through philosophers and were actually worked out and, and popularized through philosophers. Some of them we now associate with, with other uh, disciplines, but many of those disciplines are actually spin-offs from philosophy. So sometimes it's really helpful to have a philosopher who not only understands you know, something from a textbook or from a particular field, but who has a, a broader understanding of, of you know, how these ideas came to be and why they were held to be valuable or valid or, or worth you know, disseminating. Um, I think that, that it's also good, you never know what happens when you bring a philosopher in, a well-trained philosopher, because there's certain habits of thinking that, that you know, the discipline really promotes. Um, habits of paying close attention to structures and unraveling them and seeing how things work. Uh, in that we have a lot in common with engineers um, or, or systems designers. Um, you know, thinking about texts and how to, how to read them, how to make sense of them. Thinking, being able to recognize common human situations. All these sorts of issues um, they're very hard to wrap your head around, but they're the sort of things that we do in philosophy when we're doing philosophy in a, in a meaningful way, not in a purely academic, abstract, professionalized way. So that's, that's need. Then there's capacity. When I talk about capacity, what I mean is that there are a lot of people out there in, in philosophy departments, and also in many other departments as well, in history departments, poli-sci departments, English departments, people who are doing philosophy in other ways, some artists, uh, some musicians, um, some business, you know, uh, or economics people, um, some policy makers. There's, there's a lot of people out there who, whether they realize it or not, they have what it takes to do philosophy in a, in a public way or a popular or a practical way, engaged with, with other people, dealing with the kinds of problems that, that we face. So many of them may not even suspect this to be the case. The last thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to talk a lot more about this later on, is opportunity. I think that right now, uh, in large part because of the internet and in part because of the technology that we have available to us, like you know, uh, cheap flip cams that we can record things with and editing software. We're in a unique position as far as the ability to turn that capacity of, of you know, philosophers who are... Um, you know, in the past would be confined to their little college, their little library, their little, you know, circle. Um, and it would be just be totally random if they managed to, like, you know, make their, their way into the public sphere. Um, or they were well-connected and, you know, they just were doing philosophy as a sideline. Um, that, that time, that still goes on quite a bit. There's still an elite system and hierarchies and all that. But the Internet opens up the opportunity for, you know, for example, somebody like me, who doesn't have uh, an Ivy League or a big state background, um, who didn't attend the right schools, who just happened to really love reading books and could talk with people about philosophy, to be able to shoot videos and have people around the world say, yeah, I, I like this stuff, uh, I want some more of it. Uh, why don't you come and give a talk here? So, opportunity... Uh, really exists for, for doing that. And it doesn't even have to be on the side of the producers. It's also on the side of those who would like to, um, to learn about philosophy. Now, you know, if you, it's not as if you can, in fact, get a complete public or, you know, education just by watching YouTube videos. Although you can, you can learn an awful lot, can't you? We have texts available online. 
Um, you can access notes and commentaries by people. There are some free courses out there. You can connect by email or by social media with the people who are actually doing interesting work in philosophy. We have meetups that publicize, hey, there's going to be a talk here, or um, there's going to be a philosophy cafe over here, something, by the way, we're trying to get started in, in the Hudson Valley. Um, that's a whole different story. So demand, need, capacity, opportunity, these are answers to why do philosophy in a, a public or practical or popular way. I mentioned earlier that somebody might ask why are you philosophers coming out of your classrooms, coming out of your offices, coming out of your departmental buildings, and intruding yourself into you know the World Wide Web, the marketplace, uh, other people's offices, libraries, pick whatever else you like, walking into restaurants and starting conversations with people. Um, and the answer to that is actually pretty simple. That's what philosophers always did. It's not as if philosophy as a discipline had its beginnings in some sort of totally isolated, esoteric, enterprise that could only be engaged in by a few. As a matter of fact, think about Socrates and, and Plato and Aristotle and people like, like that, um, you know, as well as the other people before them who were doing philosophy. Granted, Heraclitus thought most people are dummies and you really can't do anything for them, so he wrote in an obscure way, but Socrates would talk with anybody. He was interested in finding out who knew something and whether there was any wisdom and putting things to the test and saying to people, hey, take care of your soul. That's more important than just your body or your reputation or your, your private property. Um, and, and, you know, he, he did this gen generously and he did this in a, an open public way. That's part of what got him killed, of course, you know. Uh, but hopefully that's not going to be too much of an issue. Although sometimes, you know, it, it is an issue in totalitarian societies or in other cases. Um, I don't want to dwell on that too much, but, you know, it's, it, it's been something of the very essence of philosophy to make arguments, to, to analyze claims, to, to, you know, put projects before the public eye uh, over and over and over again. I mean, Plato wrote books. Plato didn't just say, I'm only going to, you know, teach a, a select few um, he wrote books that we can access today that have come down throughout the ages. Um, Aristotle, you know, he did have his Lyceum. Um, he benefited greatly by having a patron like Alexander the Great who could send him specimens from all over the place where his troops had gone to. Um, there's a whole interesting story there. But Aristotle wrote. Um, even the guys who didn't necessarily write things down, like Epictetus, had somebody to say, man, I need to write this stuff down because this is great and, and somebody needs to, to actually preserve this. And thank God that, that his disciple Arian did that because, you know, look at the, the wonderful stuff that we have in Epictetus' discourses. So, you know, it, you could go down the line, you know, Descartes thought that he was going to revolutionize intellectual life and society. You know, he had big plans. Hegel, Philosophy is definitely something that brings all the other things together, reflects on them, and does so in a public way. And, and so, you know, we can go down all the way to the present. Um, there's always going to be some charlatans. There's always going to be some snake oil salesmen calling what they do philosophy. Plato talks about that already in the Republic, right? Um, but there's always going to be some other people out there who are, who are doing philosophy in a public way, in a practical way, in a popular way that ordinary people can relate to and benefit from. Um, and some of those will get preserved in, in, you know, for, for future uh, generations, and we can study them, we can make them part of our lives, enrich ourselves and our relationships and our, our environment and our, our institutions with them. That's, that's a, a something available to us because people have been doing philosophy that way. So it's really sort of an aberration, an anomaly, to have this hyper-scholastic way of doing academic philosophy 
where, you know, somebody has to have all sorts of prerequisites to even walk in the door. You know, granted, I'm not saying that, you know, if you want to read Hegel, you can just jump right in and make perfect sense of it, you know, and start to, you know, uh, criticize him on the basis of this or that without understanding it. But it's, it's open, it's available. It sometimes takes, you know, the work of commentators to, to help out with this. But, but it, that's something, again, going back to this issue of opportunity, we're in a unique situation now because of the, the you know, the resources of, of the Internet. So, you know, philosophy, in the way that we're talking about it, is something public, something popular, something practical. It's really not that new. In a way, it's to go back to the very roots of philosophy. There are some things that, you know, you do have to do some cultivation to fully understand. Um, but I tend to think that most people are capable of that. Some people have wondered how I got, you know, the idea to start doing philosophy the way that I'm doing it. And, you know, the story really isn't that um, dramatic. It's, it's more a matter of sort of chance or, or fortuitousness or perhaps providence. Um, and it has a lot less to do with my own planning. Most of my own plans have, have tended to go awry and turn into something completely different. Uh, and it was much more about um, people coming along and saying, you know, why don't you try this, uh, and encouraging me, and, um, you know, the, the technology and the tools being, being available to me, and then finding out that it was the kind of thing that I could get into, the kind of thing that I liked. Uh, I would say that the very beginnings of doing philosophy in a more public, popular way, for me have to do with uh, service. I think that um, because I was, I was good at understanding, difficult to understand philosophers or texts, there would be people who'd come along, and this happened all the way back in, in under my undergrad days and then happened more in graduate school, when I would lead reading groups or you know, have, you know, do some private tutoring or things like that. People would come along and say, look, you seem to understand this Hegel guy. Can you, you know, help us out in understanding the phenomenology of spirit? And, you know, I think it's, it's also helpful to have the boldness of youth and <laughs> that sort of thing. Because looking back at you know, some of the things that I jumped into um, back then, um, even like my book project, you know, that, that culminated in Reason Fulfilled by Revelation, you know, if I were to think about it rationally now and say, should I do that? I think the, the you know, the older me might say, eh, that you need to pass on that one. But, you know, you, you jump into things and then over time you start to um, develop skills. And it's one of those things that you, you learn as you go and you get better as you go. I was just listening to a podcast of a... A, uh, my, my very first paid academic uh, uh, lecture, now, I don't mean you know, teaching, I mean where I was invited to go to a school and, and give a lecture. It was a 2008 St. Anselm lecture. And I was listening to how I spoke with the crowd at that time. And I was thinking, wow, I've, I've gotten a lot better when it comes to this sort of thing in, in managing to reach people and managing to field questions and in uh, doing the sort of things that are required for academic philosophy. And I thought, well, how did that happen? It's learning by doing. It's, it's repetition. You throw yourself out there and um, you never know how an audience is going to actually react to what it is that you're bringing before them. But the good thing is, if you're doing philosophy well, you have a high quality product that in many cases will sort of sell itself. You know, if you're going to talk about Plato or Nietzsche or, you know, Descartes, you know, these great heavy hitters in philosophy, and you actually know something about it and you can communicate it to somebody else, there's a reason why people keep going back to these books because of the great ideas in them. And all you have to do is be kind of like a, a mediator. All you have to do is be an interpreter and, and uh, you know, somebody to put it in, in front of them and say, what do you think about this? So I did an awful lot of that sort of stuff. Um, 
And there, you know, I've been doing um, public talks in various places, libraries, churches, uh, other colleges and universities. Most recently, I, I just started um, doing radio spots for as a philosopher. And in each case, you're doing something a bit different. It's a different audience. And, you know, when people ask you to do this kind of stuff, I think, you know, if, you, if you've got the, the ability to do it and you know your philosophy, you jump into it because you're, you're helping out the field. You're um, spreading this... Uh, this uh, this great um, you know available wisdom that, that people have bequeathed to us that we're we're part of a conversation um, you you awaken that demand you may actually satisfy people's needs I also think that philosophers as philosophers need to be a lot more involved in things outside of philosophy where philosophy can satisfy a kind of uh, need. You know, so philosophers should be in hospitals helping people out <clears throat> with, with, with medical ethics questions, if they're properly trained in medical ethics. Philosophers should be out there um, coming in and giving le guest lectures in high schools, um, helping high school and middle school teachers to actually infuse real critical thinking or ethics into their curriculum, uh, helping them to understand that sort of thing. Um, philosophers ought to be sitting on boards. Philosophers ought to be engaging in, um, you know, local and, and dare I even say, uh, state and national politics. By the way, I'm not the guy for that sort of thing. Uh, I, I, I can't stand that sort of that sort of uh, business. But but they should be doing that sort of thing. And there are some who do that. I just think that there aren't quite quite enough. Um, so, you know, my own example, I, I got drawn into something that I never realized I would have been any good at, uh, assessment of student learning, because there was a need at my university, Fayetteville State University, for assessing things having to do with critical thinking. And I was teaching a lot of critical thinking classes, and I, I you know, encountered some interesting assessment tools, and I started thinking about this as a philosopher. And then I started realizing, man, I can do some of this stuff in ways that the education people who, you know, grant a master's in education and who have, you know, master's and PhDs in education, they can't even do or even sometimes see their way to or conceptualize. Uh, I found that I, I could um, help the business people. Uh, I developed, a, you know, or co-developed a business, ethics and business education uh, program at, at FSU as well because there was a genuine need there for it and the business people were like hey come on in and help us out you know the uh, our accrediting agency wants us to be doing some stuff with ethics we're really at sea with this um, our textbooks aren't very good can you can you help us out so that's how I got drawn into this and then you know of course the YouTube channel um, there's a whole story there um, a lot of it has to do with people pushing me to record my, my videos and then, then people on the other end responding positively and saying, hey, I like this stuff, it's helping me out, can you do some more? And I just kept on with it. Um, and, and eventually it became something I could see doing, um, if not completely full time, at least, uh, you know, about half of my time uh, ends up being devoted to video uh, production and planning and editing and all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's really helped out my, my own teaching. It's helped out my own research. There, there's a lot of things as a philosopher that when you get yourself out of your comfort zone, um, you're going to make more sense out of. You know, you might not think to yourself that shooting YouTube videos has anything to do with, you know, Plato and understanding Plato's dialogues. I find that it does. Um, and, and there's a whole long conversation that we can have there, I suppose. In any case, um, there's all different ways in which you can get involved in, in doing philosophy in, in public or popular ways. And I encourage anybody who's interested in that to, to do so. Let's talk as I finish this up about some of the opportunities that the Internet really throws in our lap to do philosophy in a in a public, in a practical, in a popular way. Um, so I, I, I'm going to actually gear my, my uh, 
discussion here, not so much at people who might want to do something similar to what I'm doing, but to a much broader audience. Um, if you like philosophy, we live in a time now where there's lots of clubs and organizations and events, and the internet is an amazing uh, environment for finding all of this sort of stuff. First of all, you can find local events near you. Uh, you know, go to, um, you know, look in Facebook and, and type in things. Use Google search to look for anything in your surrounding area. If you're in a university setting, a university town, you probably have a whole bunch of different interesting events by you. But check out local libraries, check out bookstores, check out, um, you know, philosophy cafes. There's also a whole penumbra of other kinds of events and organizations where it might not be explicitly about philosophy, but where it really is going to touch on philosophy. Great example of this, the Death Cafe movement. Um, we have a Death Cafe here in Kingston, uh, and uh, although it goes in other areas, I haven't gone to it yet, but I, but I keep meaning to. It usually ends up being at the same time as another event that I have to go to. Um, and what do the people do there? Well, it's, a, it's this movement where, where people get together and they have some coffee and, and some you know donuts or bagels or whatever, and they talk in an unstructured way about death, one of these fundamental existential realities that we have to face up to, a philosophical theme that people have been discussing since Socrates was sentenced to die and you know said to people, well, this isn't so bad, even though you think it is. Um, there's all sorts of things along these lines, and you just have to you just have to do a little bit of legwork uh, to find it. And and we're so fortunate today that we've got the internet, and and you don't have to like you know walk around to all the different places and look for you know uh, little notices or posters or things like that. There's probably a lot of websites that you can get on and put your name in and and and. It'll, it'll alert you to that sort of thing. So that's local. And then, you know, outside of your local area, you, you can participate in all sorts of cool philosophy related and, you know, even touching on philosophy kind of matters because other people out there are doing the work to organize them. Great example of this starting next week, it's Stoic Week. And these guys at the University of, I think it's Exeter, started a blog and then they created a handbook because they were interested in Stoicism. And, and now they've got a class, an online class, that, by the way, I enrolled in this year. And, um, you know, one week out of the year, we, we, we focus intensively on Stoicism. And you can do it in connection with people on the other side of the planet from you. You can trade... Uh, ideas back and forth. You can talk about, yeah, I, I, this is what I got out of Epictetus. What did you get out of Epictetus? So there's all sorts of really great things like that. Um, YouTube is a, is a wonderful resource. I don't know how many philosophy videos are out there, and they're all different kinds. I mean, I tend to shoot these very low, uh, low tech, you know, do it yourself. Um, it's all about the content man kind of kind of things that people like and and you know some of my videos are an hour and a half long and people will watch them all the way through other people do very short punchy you know high production um, kinds of you know thumbnail sketch videos and some people really like that sort of thing the great thing about about the internet is you get this entire smorgasbord set out in front of you so whatever it is that helps you with it use that. Um, if it's going to help you learn about Plato or it's going to help you learn about Aristotle or Augustine, I'm, I'm for it. Now, there's, there's some other stuff that I would like to say to people who might think about getting into this, this line, of, uh, line of work. And I think that looking back on it, there's really four things that are necessary if you wanted to do something like, say, build a YouTube channel or start doing public speaking about, about philosophy in local areas. Um, and so two of them have to do with sort of, you know, competence issues. 
Uh, and then the other two are, are other factors. So the two competence-based issues, one of them is you actually have to know something about philosophy. You can't just walk in and say, well, I really like Plato, but I don't know anything about him. I'm going to start a conversation about him and see where it goes, because that's more just a bullshit session. And, and there's room for that sort of thing. Um, having watched Monty Python skits about philosophy, not quite enough to go on, because that's at a, such a superficial level. Um, if you want to get something that will resonate with other people, you know, you've got to be able to answer questions for them. You've got to be able to go in and, and reveal to something, reveal to them something that they didn't already know about Aristotle. Um, so you do have to know your, your area. Does that mean that you have to be a complete expert? No. Do you have to have published, you know, all sorts of books on the subject? Of course not. You know, great example, the Half Hour Hegel series. Um, there are better Hegel commentators out there who have many books and articles to their credit than, than I am. But I'm the guy who actually decided to shoot the videos and who's putting in the work to do it. I do know my Hegel. You know, I, I, um, I've been studying him for, well, it's like 20 years now. <laughs> yeah, about 20 years of, of actual study of Hegel. Um, but, you know, I've only published one article on, on Hegel um, in my entire career. I've published on, on other people instead. You don't have to be the uh, top-of-the-field expert to be able to have a good, productive conversation with people where you teach them something. Um, now, maybe after they've exhausted what you have to, to, to give them, then they need to go on to somebody else. But that, that'll usually take a while. So you need competence in the sense of being a, a, you know, at an intermediate or expert level in what you're going to talk about. You also need something that's a little bit harder to, to quantify, and that is an ability to connect with, with ordinary people, people who are, are not professional philosophers, who may not in fact realize that this stuff is intrinsically valuable or interesting until you bring it across to them. Uh, I don't know how you develop those, those sorts of skills. I know for me it really helped to have to teach class after class after class of undergraduates who were not particularly interested in taking a philosophy class because I had to like stretch to, to be able to do that. I think some people are more natural at that. Other people are um, you know, a little, little bit uh, less liable to, to, to engage in that. Um, it, it probably helps to be open to other people, to um, get away from the sense that, you know, I'm the sage on the stage, I'm just going to teach all of you, shut up and listen. Um, you got to actually like other people, I think, to be able to come across well to other people. Um, but, you know, the, the, many of the, the great philosophers were people who liked people. Rene Descartes, he didn't like, you know, obstinate, bigoted people, but he liked people in general. Socrates, he would talk with anybody. Um, you know, we can, we can go on and on like that. Then another thing you really need to have is some sort of passion or excitement, uh, interest that you can communicate to your, your audience. Um, so, you, you know, you, you really should, if you're going to try to get into doing lectures or shooting videos, do it about stuff that you love first. Um, now, I, I'm, you know, a professional teacher, so I can be a bit more disinterested uh, in, in a text, in a topic. I can appreciate it in a kind of, you know, way that's, that's uh, not quite so it, it, about it being excited and more about, well, this is a great work of philosophy. Like, you know, Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant does not, you know, trip my triggers, but I recognize he's a great philosopher, and I enjoy, you know, talking about Kant. Um, you, you notice I don't have any publications on Kant because I, I, you know, I don't want to write about Kant. I've got other stuff that I'm more excited about that I would rather write on, like Aristotle, you know. But um, if you ask me to do a lecture on Kant, yeah, why not? Great philosopher, interesting ideas. I think he's wrong on a lot of stuff, but, you know, first, before we worry about whether he's right or wrong, we've got to figure out what the guy actually said. So you need, you need to have some sort of passion or excitement or interest in what you're teaching. And then the fourth thing is perseverance. 
if you're going to start a YouTube channel or you're going to start giving talks, it takes a while before you get traction, let me tell you. And it'll often, I mean, you'll, you'll spend a lot of time, this has been the case for me, showing up to places and having three people in the audience. That can happen, by the way, in academic conferences, too. Um, I remember one time being on a Hobbes panel where there were five people on the panel and there were three people in the audience. Um, you just got to keep sticking with it, you know. And if you keep on generating good content, uh, good content in the sense that I talked about before, you know, you're, you're passionate about what you're doing, you actually know what you're talking about, you're able to connect with ordinary people, eventually other people are going to start to to catch on to it. If you're, if you're generating a valuable product, people will eventually start liking your, your product and talking about it with other people. And with philosophy, you know, you've got the at least with the kind that I do. I'm a historian of philosophy. I don't have to reinvent any sort of wheels or come up with anything new myself. It's enough for me to teach about these brilliant people and their great insights that they had, um, you know, going back millennia. Um, I could be doing videos the rest of my life just about the people that I'm, I'm excited about talking about. Um, it's, it's an incredible opportunity. So you can do that too if you want to. Um, or you don't have to. You can just, you know, enjoy what other people are producing. There is a, a genuine joy in learning, in, in uh, encountering truth, in using our minds. This is the highest part of us as human beings. Um, and there's something really enjoyable about doing that. And that's what philosophy brings. So to bring this to a close, once again, Happy World Philosophy Day 2014. I hope that you'll join me for uh, the event that I've got planned for it later on today. And, uh, you know, sign up for Stoic Week and, and look, look for other philosophy-related things. And I will see you uh, next World Philosophy Day 2015, and we'll have a whole different conversation then.